Hello, this is Mrs Moss and today's lesson is going to look at writing, in particular writing to describe an image. The lesson objective is to know how to write an effective description. If you need to, pause the screen now so that you can go and get a pen and some paper. And what we're going to look at in this lesson is we're going to look at how we build detailed descriptions and how we create effect through our word choices, through our structure and through our use of devices. For your do now task, have a look at the following sentence and answer the question, do you think it's an effective description? I was looking at his eyes. Here's the problem that I think we have with a sentence like this. Perhaps when you read that sentence, you were picturing these eyes. Maybe you're picturing these eyes. Or did you picture somebody much younger? Perhaps these eyes. Was I was looking at his eyes an effective description? I would suggest no. And the reason for that is because to write an effective description, you need to think of the effect that you want to achieve and then choose well-chosen detail to achieve it. There was no detail within that sentence that led you as a reader to picture what I wanted you to see. To demonstrate this point further to you, have a look at these two descriptions, A and B. Which description do you think is better? As a challenge, what makes one description more effective than the other? Just give you a few seconds to read those descriptions. OK, let's look at the sentences then. Yes, one's longer than the other. That doesn't always necessarily mean that it's a better description. But in this case, I would suggest that B is the stronger description. Why is that? What does A tell me about the character? Just a few details. But I can't really see from those details, the large eyes and the big beard, what it is that the author wants me to see. I could be picturing an evil, malevolent character, or quite, quite similarly, you could be pitching Santa Claus. The description's not effective. However, if we look at B, we have black eyes that were restless, sly and cunning, his mouth and chin bristly with the stubble of a coarse, hard beard. Already as a reader, I'm beginning to see a very specific character type. And it's clear for me that in B, the writer had the effect that he wanted to create very clearly in his mind before he began to add the details in. Sentence B was actually a sentence written by Charles Dickens, and it is the start of a description of one of his characters that was a villain. Having said that, in front of you on the screen now is the rest of the paragraph that continues that description. And your first task is going to be to choose the most appropriate adjectives from the grey box to place into that paragraph at the points I've indicated. Remember that the effect that Dickens was creating was that of a villainous character. If you want to, and you want to add an extra level of challenge to this task, then you could use your own adjectives to create a purposeful effect. You have one minute. That time is indicated on the screen for you now. For numbers one to five, write down what you think the adjective should be to create the effect of an effective description of a villainous character. About halfway through your time. OK, I should be looking at that last section of the paragraph now. OK, and that time's complete. So let's have a look at the answers. Mm -hmm. 
His black eyes were restless, sly and cunning, his mouth and chin bristly with the stubble of a coarse, hard beard, and his complexion was one of that kind which never looks clean or wholesome. But what added most to the grotesque expression of his face was a ghastly smile, which, appearing to be the mere result of habit and to have no connection with any mirthful or complacent feeling, constantly revealed the few discoloured fangs that were yet scattered in his mouth and gave him the aspect of a panting dog. You have this time now to self-assess your answers. Hopefully you've chosen all of those adjectives which helped to convey a villainous and as he's used there in the adjectives grotesque and rather unsightly character. Now that we know the adjectives that Dickens actually chose for his description, I want you to have a go at answering those questions on the right hand side of your screen. OK, you're going to have a minute to complete those questions that will appear on the screen to help you. So start answering them now. So we're looking at what is the impression that Dickens creates? And secondly, we're looking at what detail does he zoom in on to do this? And lastly, what did you notice about the use of adjectives? Those adjectives that you selected and that you can see in green now that are in the description of this character. About halfway through your time, so you should be looking at the detail now that he zooms in on. And now let's be thinking about what did we notice, what was significant about the choice of adjectives within this description. Okay, that's your one minute complete. So let's now self-assess our answers to those questions. On the screen in front of you now, you can actually see an artistic impression of the character um, that we've been reading the descriptions of today. Have a look at that as we answer these questions. So what was the impression that Dickens creates? Well, this is Quilp, and as I said to you, he's a villain. And what that meant was that description showed that he was very vicious, he's kind of ill-tempered, and he's also a grotesque dwarf, which is why um, Dickens was describing his physical um, qualities in, in quite a negative way. What detail did he zoom in on? Three, really. So he first he looked at the eyes, and then he moved on to the mouth, and also the chin of the character. And what did you notice about the choice of adjectives? All of them had negative connotations. They're all dark and unnerving um, word choices. Why is that important? What's the point that I've been trying to stress to you? It's that to write an effective description, you need to think of the effect that you want to achieve and then you use well chosen detail to achieve it. That's why Dickens' description of Quilp is so effective. He knew that he wanted to describe a villain and he knew that and therefore chose the best language to enable him to do so. We're going to move on now to look at how we might use devices in our descriptions. And to enable me to discuss with you how devices can be used effectively, I've taken a little bit of artistic license. I've stayed with that description of the quilt character, but I've um, changed it to include some devices, okay? So those devices that I've included are alliteration, but in this case, sibilance, personification, animal imagery, metaphor, and simile. And for your next task, I want you to try and link up the underlined phrases from the paragraph to the correct device on the right hand side of the screen. OK, you're going to have a minute to complete that task. So we're looking for alliteration or sibilance. We're looking for an example of personification, animal imagery, metaphor and simile in the following paragraph. He sniffed the air. 
His black eyes were restless, marble, sly and sardonic, his mouth and chin bristly with the stubble of a coarse hard beard, and his complexion was one of that kind which never looks clean or wholesome, but what added most to the grotesque expression of his face was a ghastly smile which would turn to greet you, revealing the few discoloured fangs that were scattered in his mouth like a snarling dog. Okay, so link up the device to the correct example. That's your time complete, so let's have a look at the correct answers together now. So firstly, he sniffed the air was an example of animal imagery. And this is animal imagery because it is an image that we would more associate with animals picking up a scent than with a person. The next device that we see is a metaphor, and that's because we've described black eyes as marbles and we haven't used the words like or as, so that is metaphoric. The next example is alliteration, sly and sardonic, and it's sibilance because um, the, let, the words are alliterative but with the letter S, so that's an example of sib sibilance. Next, we have the example of personification, the way that the smile turns to greet you. Now, it doesn't do this of its own accord. It's not a person. And so the fact that we've given humanised qualities to it means it's an example of personification. And lastly, we finish off with the simile like a snarling dog. And it's also here an example of that extended animal imagery that's been continued from the start of the paragraph. I'm going to give you a top tip here. I have put quite a variety of devices within this one paragraph, but what you need to do when you write your description is you really, really need to control your use of devices. You do not need one in every sentence, okay? It's not going to be an effective description if we have a simile on every line. You need to control them, think about whether they add to the effectiveness of your description or not, and to place them accordingly. So, so far I've stressed to you, to you the importance of having the idea of what the effect is that you want to create before you start writing your description. We've also looked at the importance of word choice and we just looked at the use of devices within descriptions. Now let's have a think about how we structure our descriptions effectively. So you have some questions on the right hand side of the screen there and they're asking you to look at sentence lengths, punctuation, and the structure of the paragraph, okay? You're gonna have one minute to complete them. So you're answering firstly, what sentence lengths and structures have been used in this paragraph and why? What's the effect of those choices? Okay, now have a look at the punctuation. Is there a range that's been used? And can you identify any punctuation that's been used for an, a specific effect? And then consider the paragraph as a whole. How do you think that that description has been structured? Actually, one minute complete. Let's have a look at some of the answers that you might have come up with. Okay, so firstly, what we have is an example of short sentences used for effect. We have that here at the beginning of the paragraph, he sniffed the air, and again returned to at the end of the paragraph with he sniffed again. And why are they effective? Well, they're short because purposefully they're quite jolting. They shock you into the action. And also um, they do the same at the end of the paragraph. But we do have a variety of sentence lengths. We've also got within the middle of the paragraph, long and complex sentences. So this sentence here is complex. And you could argue as well that these are purposeful because when we're describing something in detail, often we use those long, complex sentences. We have got a range of punctuation that's used within, okay? So some of the more impressive examples would be the use of semicolons, 
and commas, which have been used effectively and accurately throughout the complex sentences. And you have got purposeful use. So if we look at this use of ellipsis at the end of the paragraph, which leaves it very open ended and leaves the reader guessing as to what's going to happen next. In terms of the structure of the whole piece, what's quite clever is the use of the same phrase at the beginning and at the end. It's a clever way of structuring the description. And also, of course, we've got this use of zoom. OK, so zooming in on detail to help structure the description on things such as the ghastly smile. Top tip here again for you. We've just been looking at one paragraph here and thinking about the sentences and the punctuation, but you do need to carefully consider the structure of your entire text. OK, so, for example, what I mean by that is, are you going to vary your paragraph lengths for effect? Are you going to use clever structural tools to help frame your description? So are you going to start with and end with the same image within your description? OK, so remember that we need to look at structure as a whole for the complete text and description that you're going to write. On the screen now is an example of an exam style question. So this type of question is going to be found in your English language GCSE. It will be in paper one and it will appear in the following format. So you'll have an image within your question paper and then you'll have a choice of questions. It'll sound something like this. They always give you a scenario like the one you can see here. A magazine has asked for contributions to their creative writing section and then you have a choice. So either write a description of a scene as suggested by this picture or write a story about a time in the past. Now what we've looked at in this lesson today is writing a description of a scene. I'm going to point that out to you now so that's really clear. We haven't touched on how to write an effective narrative or story. OK, so for the purpose of this exam question, I'm showing you how it would look. You would have a choice, but the skills and the, and the um, ideas that I've given you today are for that first option. You can also see that you are given 24 and possible 24 marks for your content and organisation. But we haven't spoken about and it's really important to point out to you now is that you also get a maximum of 16 marks for technical accuracy. Yes, that means spelling. It means the correct use of punctuation, the correct use of paragraphs throughout your um, description. So on the screen in front of you now is an image taken from that example exam question. And the task that you're going to complete today is to write a description that is based on what you can see in the image. On the right hand side of the screen, I've given you a success criteria. And this goes through all of the things that we've looked at in the lesson today that are all components that are going to make your descriptions really effective. I would recommend that you plan your answer to this question. And I would suggest starting off that plan with answering the first point of the success criteria. So what is the effect that you want to achieve? So if we look at this image, for me, the atmosphere is very busy and excited. And that would be the effect that I wanted to create with my description. So in the middle of my plan, perhaps as a mind map, I might have the keyword busy or excited. I would then branch out to look at the next part, which would be my word choice, carefully chosen words, of course, that stayed within that lexical field of being busy or excited. And I would stay within that lexical field again, moving on to my simile, metaphor, imagery, personification, devices I might want to include that would create that same effect. Don't forget to plan your structure. So there's lots going on in this image today. Are you going to zoom in on different parts of the image? You could, to help you, think about using the senses, because it's not only important describing what we can see in the picture. Let's not forget we could be describing the sounds and the smells and the sensation of being in such a busy scene. If you can achieve it, a really clever idea might be to move from small, um, describing a really small object into describing the largeness of the scene. So I think almost you're filming the scene, you're behind your camera and you've zoomed in really closely at the start of your description on one small piece and then you're moving out and seeing more of the screen as you, as you do so. Are you going to have a repetition of phrases or images in a similar way to I demonstrated in the paragraph of the quilt character? 
don't forget next, you've got to vary your sentences, you've got to vary your paragraphs. That means they need to be different lengths, they need to start differently so that you avoid this kind of repetition of the same phrases um, that's not purposeful, of course. And you also need to think about using different structures within them. And don't forget, you do need to have accurate spelling and punctuation and you need to use a range of punctuation and that needs to be purposeful. You need to use punctuation for effect, okay, showing that you have complete control over it. So I'm going to suggest that you pause the screen now, spend an absolute minimum of 40, 45 minutes answering this question and writing your response. And when you've finished writing your response and that time is over, join us again for the rest of the lesson. So well done. Writing for that length of time is difficult. It does require lots of stamina. What I would suggest you do now is have a look at the success criteria again on the right hand side of the screen. Work your way through it and I would set myself a target. As an example, I might say, for next time, I'm going to try and adapt structure a little bit more. I'm going to try and move from a small object to a large one, or I'm going to try to use repetition of exactly the same phrase to cleverly structure and focus the reader's attention on one point in my description. Well done for all your hard work today.